Last year I made a list of the top 12 movies of 2014. In the list I had American Hustle, I had Snowpiercer, I had Wolf of Wall Street, but the number one movie of last year in my opinion, Warner Brothers DC direct-to-video animated feature film called Justice League Flashpoint. I then reached out to that filmmaker, the director of Flashpoint on Twitter. His name's Jay Olivia, and he's my next guest. Jay, in addition to directing Flashpoint, has directed Young Justice, the best Justice League Teen Titans TV series that I've ever seen. He has directed most of the best animated Marvel and DC films. Jay also directed Dark Knight Rises Part 1 and Part 2, also animated feature films, and both of them blow Dark Knight Rises out of the water. And that, I don't mean that disrespectfully to Chris Nolan, they, they just do. Today, he's gonna pitch his interpretation of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. However, he's gonna do it as an HBO-style series. My name is Jay Oliva. My pitch would be uh, a remake or a reboot of Masters of the Universe, you know, which is a very popular Mattel toy line back from the 80s when I grew up as a kid. Bring it back to its roots, which is from from my understanding, because I had worked on the Mike Young reboot back in 2002. As a kid, I remembered it one way, and I saw it as an adult and as a filmmaker, and I was like, okay, there's some things I would, I would fix, some things I would adjust, as well as still understand what the charm of the original was. I believe Mattel wanted to do Star Wars, but they also wanted to do Conan. So they decided to, let's just combine the two and create something called the Masters of the Universe. One of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to have a broad kind of epic storyline where we went from He-Man and, and went through his journey of Prince Adam, uh, you know, getting the sword and, and becoming the hero that we all know and love. But then at some point I wanted to, to add a little bit of tragedy where something went wrong into the storyline. And then I wanted that to be the transition to She-Ra, She-Ra, Princess of Power, and then do her storyline, but with still Prince Adam as kind of like this kind of through story, almost like how Anakin Skywalker is in the Star Wars movies. We kind of bring it back to Adam's story, Prince Adam's story, or King Adam at that point. Tone-wise, was making more like Lord of the Rings. You know, fantasy is huge, but it's really hard for Hollywood to kind of take a chance on fantasy because of the fact that it is very expensive. Almost like how Star Wars is, where you can have magic like the Force, but at the same time you can have lasers and robots and over-the-top, you know, uh, ships and space battles and sword-to-sword -sword hand fighting and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Engage the audience, give you characters that you love, because of course, you know, everybody's going to like He-Man, but I think he's got a really good supporting characters. I was, of course, have Tila. I've had Man at Arms, you know, the whole roster of, of characters, as well as his father, King Randor and Queen Marlena. I'd even bring in Hordak, which is uh, Shira's arch nemesis, and bring him into the fold, as well as King Hiss and all the Snake Men. Some characters you'll fall in love with, some characters, you know, you'll, you'll die, some characters will go beyond what they were, you know, a character that you, that you may have hated in the first batch of movies will at one point redeem himself and become someone that you love. It's a lot of these strong personalities and their motivations and how sometimes those motivations go against other people. Same thing with Breaking Bad, like you're watching Breaking Bad, the series, and it, and it totally takes the idea of what you think that series is going to be and just turns it upside down and gives you something entirely new. And I think the idea for Masters of the Universe could be something like that, where we take an idea which is, you know, the, the original idea of what it was, and then really flesh out everybody's personality. All these different um, factions all have their own motivations, and I think that's something that I think no one's really touched upon. And I think because of that, like I would say, I would start the story small, follow the story of Prince Adam, you know, get the audience to understand him, and then slowly open up the world to the point where whenever you jump to a different character, you just can't wait to come back to that character because their, their story is so compelling and it's so different than everybody else's. The look of the world for the Masters of the Universe, more stylized shots and, you know, grand sweeping uh, John Ford type of uh, look, which is what I like. The very well choreographed, like, Hong Kong style fights, not to the point where it's too much wire work, but I want kind of very choreographed fight choreography, like you'll see something like The Raid. I think the Marvel Universe does a really good job of their choreography. I'd like to take that past what it's done and do it with, with not just hand-to-hand -hand choreography and gunplay, but also with sword fighting. And Because and, the one thing about Masters of the Universe which is great is that you've got shields and you know, war horses, battle cats, fight choreography would be like the Marvel films, the comic book kind of action. In terms of stunt work and kind of set pieces you can come up with that I haven't quite seen. I, there's so many like iconic moments that I think that we can come up with that's based upon the He-Man universe that has yet to be seen on the big screen. 
take what we know and love about the characters, expand on it, but still stay true to the characters. Take the uh, character of Prince Adam. You know, everybody thinks that oh, he's he's a good guy, he's a good kid. He gets a sword and he becomes He Man, and He Man is you know true justice in the American way, so to speak. Now the thing is, what we did in the old um, 2002 series when when Prince Adam lifted the sword up above and he called, you know, by the power of Grayskull, he's actually channeling this, this very powerful being who once lived many, many years ago, King Grayskull, who was basically the founder of, I guess, the human race on Eternia. Putting the power of this Grayskull inside of him, but he still was himself. You know, it's a very like Shazam or Captain Marvel storyline. Just like with the Game of Thrones with Ned Stark, when you play the Game of Thrones, you either win or you die. And that's the same thing I think with, with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. And as things either work his way, work against him, you'll start to see his motivations change. King Randor doesn't know that, that Prince Adam is He-Man. And he's always like looking at he-Man going, you know, why can't you be more like him, you know, being carefree, and, and when I grew up, I, I had to grow up in this war-torn kind of world, but here's this guy, and he's doing what's right, why can't you be more like him? So I like that uh, kind of play between the father and son, where, he, where Adam can't really tell his dad, but at the same time, he's kind of happy the fact that he's being He-Man and doing things that his dad kind of approves of, or doesn't approve of. Not just start with Adam's story, but allude to things that happened beforehand. Kind of show when Randor, before he became king, what did he have to do to become king? Him and his uh, half-brother Keldor, who eventually becomes Skeletor, the, the reason why Skeletor wants to you know, take over Eternia is because he's the rightful king. He should have been there, but because of his blue skin and because of his background, so that's why I want to touch upon that little bit of you know, uh, racial aspect to it. I would play him up pretty much the way he is because he's kind of like the voice of reason and wisdom. He's the one who taught everybody how to fight and created the weapons. He'll kick ass when he has to, but at the same time, he's seen the things that Randor had to do and may not have approved of him, but, you know, Randor was his king and he was following him. And I think that's kind of this nice dynamic between them all. And then his daughter, Tila, is now best friends with Adam. So you play up that dynamic. Now, I wouldn't do a love thing. I would do a thing where it's mo mostly like they grew up together and there's competition. It would be things, some things that would happen in the story that I plan on doing that happens to Tila that will eventually push Adam one way or the other. All because of their relationships with their other characters, somebody that he loves, you know, something might happen to his mother, for example, Queen Marlena. You never really hear much of her, you know, it's always about his dad, and she's always just like, listen to your father. And I wanted to kind of add that to his kind of storyline so that when things happen to Tila and eventually maybe to his mother, that might eventually push Adam over the edge. Even though He-Man is the hero, but we needed Adam from what he learned from his father and all of his support group to become a hero without the power, so to speak, and, and become the guy who has to convince the other, other factions to be like, hey, we have to band together for this greater evil. You know, the great uh, animation director uh, Miyazaki said that when asked why he has so many female characters, because you can have your main character cry and, and not feel like you're taking away any kind of heroic from that person. If you have Prince Adam cry, some people are like, I don't know. He-Man doesn't cry, but She-Ra or Adora, if you have her cry, it's all, it's okay. I think she can connect better with the audience because you can empathize with her. When Adam grew up, he grew up kind of, uh, not spoiled, but to the point that he grew up in a time of peace. With Adora's, I want to do the opposite, where when she was growing up and when she was born, it was a time of war. The power of what uh, um, Adam used, how he used it, not to say he, he misused it, like he used it the way that we all expected him to use it. She-Ra, on the other hand, has that, that knowledge, the wisdom that maybe Adam had told him, like, don't go into, don't follow the path that I did. Doing the Masters of the Universe and having a, a, this kind of epic storyline that, that goes from Adam to She-Ra and then back to Adam again is this really grand sweeping story, you know, that I think that most fans haven't seen in terms of uh, fantasy and science fiction. He Man's gonna be the hardest one. I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know. I think The Rock would be cool. You could do a, a no name person, but I think what you would have to do is you'd have to dual cast. When you see Prince Adam and you see He Man, you'd be like, those are totally different people, you know? But then as Prince Adam grew into King Adam, you start to see, like, oh, it looks just like how he was when he was He Man. Tila and Man at Arms is one of those people that you can kind of cast, and they can, you can have them younger or older, depending on. Um, where we are story-wise. Skeletor would just be all CGI, but we'd have to find like uh, Michael Fassbender to be like Keldor before, uh, before he ended up turning into Skeletor. I think somebody like that where he's like, he's charming, he's good looking, and, and so when he loses his face and just becomes this, this skull, it's, it's quite, quite tragic. Evelyn, I don't know who I would cast, but she has to be very like beautiful and striking and charming in her own little way. Uh, I have big plans of what I want to do eventually happen with Evelyn too. 
for Skeletor, my idea for him, most versions of Skeletor has been he's a bad guy, he wants to control the world. Skeletor, his original name was Keldor, and he's a half-brother to King Randor. King Randor's father, during the wars between him and these blue-skinned guys, maybe we'll call them the Gar, they were the two kind of major factions at this point. But King Randor's father, maybe he fell in love with a young uh, emissary from the, the blue people. He ended up having a child with this the blue-skinned person. His wife at the time, his queen, is like, who's this? And he's like, uh, I, I don't know this person. Because they had just finished the war, it, it's so racially charged. He really loved this girl. He loved, he loved his mother, Keldor's mother, but because of what was happening, couldn't really do it because of duty. You know, that whole, when I become king and duty, I have to do this. Keldor, he, at some point, he's like, you know, I, I can't stay with my own people because I'm not pure like them. I can't go to where my father is because I'm not pure for them. I'm just going to wander the land. All his life, his, his mother's told him, you're, you're destined for greatness. It's kind of like the character of Achilles. Do you want a long life that has nothing that really is that no one will speak about but you live a long time or do you want to live a short life that's glorious that everyone will sing about for the ages that's what he wants like he could care less about living a long life that's uneventful he runs into Evelyn. her father was the guy who ran the great library Keldor went to the great library said hey i need to find these books about dark magic that's never, no one's ever spoken about Evelyn's father's like no uh, there's we can't show you that, it's too top secret. If you look at it, you, you'll die. But Evelyn overhears this and kind of a little smitten about who Keldor is. Because Keldor, he's a, he's a quite good looking man. For some reason, there's an attraction. And so she's like, well, you know what? I'll, I'll get you a peek at those books, you know, but you have to promise to take me with you when you leave the city. He finds out that, that there is this altar of power. It's actually an altar to Hordak. And Hordak is this kind of god ancient evil that no one has ever seen or even known about for a millennia. He goes over and he says, hey, I want, uh, I need power. He wants to find a way to unite his the blue skin guys and the Eternians together because and not look at colors, not look at and that's what Keller really ultimately wants to do. Give me some little bit of your power and I will I'll do what you want. And then there's a fight and that's where Keldor gets mortally wounded at his that his face and he's dying. Evil Lynn takes him to back to the altar of Hordak and says, save his life. And then Hordak's like, well, there's a price. I'll, I'll give you my soul to become, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of what I call the prophet of Hordak, deal with the devil kind of thing. And then at that point, the birth of Skeletor happens. The sword of power, that sword has to be wielded by someone like Prince Adam to fight this, this power that is Hordak. Now, I like to play up the fact that Prince Adam wasn't ready for the sword. So in terms of death in the, in the series, I don't want to do a thing where it's death for the sake of death because of uh, series like Game of Thrones and the fact that no one's safe. You know, that's why I would like to call the series Masters of the Universe, because if by saying Masters of the Universe, you can kind of leave it ambiguous who is really the main character. Now, what's great about it is the audience will automatically think that He-Man is going to be the main character, and for the most part, we'll play it up that way. I was going to have King Randor die while He-Man is out away. So when He-Man comes back, he finds his father dead. We had this idea that Skeletor found this kind of loophole in the laws of Eternia that allowed him, heir to the throne, to challenge the guy who's on the throne now to personal combat. Eventually ends up mortally wounding him and killing him. When He-Man comes back, Skeletor is sitting on the throne. I had this really cool idea where he's sitting on the throne and, and He-Man like, pulls out the story. He's like, what have you done? And Skeletor is like, you can't touch me. I'm the king now. You have to listen to me. And so this is where you have your very first kind of moral dilemma. You know, He-Man has always been fighting for it. This is the law, you know, and this is what's right. But so what you're gonna do is you have Prince Adam where he's like, I want revenge, but yet you can't, he can't because he's He-Man. He doesn't know what to do because Skeletor is like, uh, I've basically made you an outlaw. So He-Man's like, he doesn't know what to do. And so he wanders the land. And in his wanderings, he hears about a rumor about how to bring people back from the dead. His father died without him knowing that he was the greatest hero in the land. Adam kind of needed that. He hears about this and he goes to the gates of hell and he fights his way through the gates, the different, almost like Dante's Inferno, the different levels of hell. And he's finding people that he wants to save, but he can't because they're souls that are stuck in hell. And he gets to the lowest depth of hell and he finds his father. Takes his father and he fights his way back up, all the different levels. It's almost like game of death. He gets to the end, he pulls out, he's like, Father, I, I, you know, I brought you back. Now you can put things back right the way it was. Skelter's taken over, I don't know what to do. I need your help. We need to work together to get, to get this to work out. Comes back into the world and then his father looks at him and just blasts him and he slams against a wall or whatever and he looks up he's kind of bleeding his father's like 
Don't you understand? When you when you're dead, you're dead. Then morphs into Hordak. He Man was tricked to free Hordak from his imprisonment, his physical entity into this world. I would then cut to Skeletor on the throne, and he would then grab his head like, oh. He Long time ago, when Kel when Skeletor took the power of Hordak, Hordak now wants that 10% so that he can become whole and be back the you know the power that he was. He has to go after Skeletor to get that. Skeletor and He-Man have to work together. And that's when you really touch upon the fact that maybe Skeletor mentions it to Adam, like, you know I'm your uncle, you know, we're family. Everything that, that King Randor wasn't to Adam, Keldor or Skeletor becomes to Adam, comes to He-Man in terms of like teaching him things and, and kind of like being that father figure that he always wanted, but being a father figure within the, you know, within the confines of this of battle and, and in this world, it's a band of brotherhood kind of thing. Skeletor at this point has become so insane because his, his bouts of insanity because of the fact that Hordak's in this world and it, it, the power wants to leave him all the time has gotten so bad, he actually wants He-Man to kill him. If you do this, then Hordak can't get the power back. And of course, it's a moral dilemma. He man's like, no, I, I can't. This whole journey, we've grown so much together. It's almost like a mercy killing. He man eventually kills Skeletor. And what happens is the sword breaks. The sword of power breaks. He's like, and then he reverts back to Adam. And he's like, what happened? You can't kill with the sword of power. You know, it's about life. And, and so he did it, not knowing that that would undo the sword. And did Skeletor always plan that? Or did Hordak always plan that? It's now King Rander, where basically he is going to the different uh, factions of the world, all the different guys, and trying to put them all together. Remember, he doesn't have the sword anymore, right? So he has to basically use everything that he learned from being He-Man and, and being trained and all these kind of things without the power of He-Man. They know that there's this growing evil that's basically taking over lands and taking over enslaving people. And so they're trying to go around trying, ahead of, uh, of Hordak's hordes, so to speak, to unite, to unite the land, either you unite or you die. While he was away in hell, that was when uh, Queen Marleta gave birth to um, Adora. When we come back, we can do a time jump, so that way Adora is a little bit older. We don't have to see her as a nine years old. We can actually see her as maybe like 18, 17. We get to meet Adora. Now she's part of the resistance, King Adam's kind of faction of trying to unite the people. At the end of that, what happens? King Randor's castle gets attacked. Adam is sitting there and he's holding the power, the sword of power. It's broken. I'm just going to fight and I'm going to die. Man at arms is there and he's like, you have to leave with us. Prince Adam is like, well, you know, you have Adora, she'll be the heir, you know, my mother will help her. This is what I have to do. You know, my, my father built, built, built this castle, built this throne. I'm going to defend it to my dying breath. Adora then comes to him and says, and what our father had done and our grandfather had done will always live in our hearts. You know, the Eternia will always stand for, for everything that they built it for. And for you to die, it's not going to help anybody. Finally, he goes. He takes the the, the shards of, of the sword of the power sword and puts it in the case and then takes it away. Now, when they flee the castle, uh, Adora's ship crash lands and she's lost in the woods. She ends up finding her way to the ruins of Grayskull Castle. One of the first things that Hordak did when he arrived on this world, he went to Castle Grayskull and he's like, "This is where the sword of power came from. I'm going to destroy it." And just destroys it, and that's when she runs into the sorceress. And at this point, the sorceress has is that now Tila because Tila is the sorceress's daughter the original sorceress and she died now Tila took over the sorceress is like you're destined for something great Adora's like I don't know what you're talking about and she looks down and then you see this sword rising up from the the darkness and then she opens it up and it's it's She-Ra's sword it's a sword of power you were really the one that was meant to fight Hordak your brother Adam had to be chosen he wasn't ready and so she then takes this new sword out and it becomes Shira. Inherently, what goodness is, is about self-sacrifice. She, she slams a sword down, sacrifices herself in order to imprison a Hordak back into where he was. Because you can't kill Hordak because he's this entity, his energy that's always around, which is what King Grayskull did a long time ago. But because of that, her essence is now into that sword. So the very last image of the entire series would be the Eternia Castle being rebuilt. King Adam is on the throne. You know, he's surrounded by all the different dignitaries from all the different peoples. A sorceress, Tila, show up at the far end and she's walking forward and she has this big box and King Adam opens it up. He sees that it's, just, it's Shira's sword. This is for you to safeguard when the unspeakable evil shows up. And so he takes it up and he puts it on the mantle next to the broken shards of his power sword and then it ends on that. It's a nice kind of bookend that you start with Prince Adam but you end with King Adam. Having the power 
And with him, with no power, he was able to unite everybody. The blue skin guys, every different race, everybody under one banner for the greater good of everyone. There was always a moral, you know, there was always kind of a theme that every, every show had. So I would like to do a thing where those morals and themes are still woven within the storyline. So you can still have stories about strong friendships and loyalty and love, themes like that that I think is very inherent to the He-Man universe. What if Tarantino made a Batman movie? They don't just exist in some writer's head. They're a little too out there. If you'd like me to keep making more, please share this with all your friends. I hope you enjoy them.